Hi, what I have here on workbench today is a Fernersi DPOX180H dual channel handheld oscilloscope. It is a relatively new model, and when it first came out a few months ago, Banggood actually contacted me, asking me to do a review on this model. But I initially turned it down, as to be very honest, I saw the claimed 180 MHz bandwidth, and I thought it was just some marketing gimmick, and perhaps the number was highly inflated. Anyway, in a month followed, I kept getting requests from viewers wanting me to do a review of this oscilloscope. So because you guys wanted to see this, I requested from Banggood after all, and I did mention to them I would report whatever I find during the review, and they seem to be fine with it. So be sure to stick around to the end, and I'm going to give you my honest opinion on this oscilloscope. Anyway, remember to subscribe to the channel, as it would certainly help me negotiating product reviews with manufacturers and keep producing videos like this. As always, I'll provide a link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. And just to put things into perspective, here is my O1 HDS 272S side by side with the Fernersi, and you can see that the Fernersi is definitely a little bit smaller than the O1. They are similar in width and thickness, but the Fernersi is quite a bit shorter. Now, this oscilloscope actually has quite a few unusual features for a device at just over $100. The model prefix is DP. It actually means digital phosphor. It basically mimics the displays of your traditional analog oscilloscopes and does some intensity grading or change of the color temperature based on how frequent the signal occurs at the specific location on the screen here. This is not a feature you typically find on a $100 scope. My Mixic STO-1004 has it, but that one is much more expensive. Another spec that is predominantly advertised is its 50,000 waveforms per second waveform update rate. We will have to see how this translates into its real-world performance when we do the testing later. And of course, the specified 3dB bandwidth is 180 MHz, and this figure is also in the model number itself. So I guess it really is a huge gamble for Fernersi if it is not able to deliver what is advertised. I guess we'll find out very soon. Oh, and also it has a built-in signal generator as well. Besides the scope, it also comes with a pair of these 200 MHz bandwidth probes. So I guess either it's all smoke and mirror, or they're really confident of their bandwidth claim. And you also get a USB charger and a USB-C cable as well. It does come with a manual, but uh, you can see it's very hard to read as there is no paragraphs, everything is just lumped together. And more importantly, there is no specifications which I can find of any kind, which is very odd. I would assume that having some basic specification is a must for any test equipment, but apparently not for this Fernersi scope here. Anyway, I know you are all dying for me to power it on, so let's do that. And as you can see, it powered on really quickly. And by the look of it, it has both channels enabled by default. So let's take a look at how intuitive the menu is. All right, let's take a look. By the way, the Fenersi does come with this stand. You can see that it extends really far back. But nevertheless, it's very secure when you put it on the table here. So let's see if we can turn off channel 2. So let's go to menu. Oh, the menu is quite fancy here. And I think I need to press channel. Let's do channel two. Yep, channel enabled. Let's uh, turn it off. And let's go back. Yep, no problem at all. And by the look of it, the movement of the trace can be controlled by the up and down buttons here. And right now we're in the course movement and you can actually fine tune the movements if you press the move button again. Very nice. So let's uh, put it in the middle here. And let's go back to the Channel setting, let's just take a look at here. The channel by default is DC coupled, so let's change it to AC coupled. We have quite of these functions, we definitely need to take a look a little bit later here. Of course, just like you, I'm very eager to verify the bandwidth claim, so let's do that first. And here's the setup. The test signal will be coming in from the HP 8642B RF signal generator back there, as you can see. And that currently is set up to output a 10 MHz signal. I currently turned the RF off. 
And also I have terminated the probe end with a 50 ohm through adapter as you can see here. So let me turn on the RF output and let's observe on the scope. And let me zoom it in a little bit. Let me acquire the signal first. And we acquired the 10 MHz signal with no problem. As you can see, that's reading 10 MHz. Right now, the output is adjusted to be at around 4.4 dBm. So given the cable loss, the measured 1 volt peak to peak should be in the ballpark with a 50 ohm load. And now let me increase the frequency here. So right now, remember we're at 10 MHz. Let's uh, go to 50. Here at 50 MHz, the acquired signal is quite stable, as you can see. And uh, the amplitude did increase a tiny bit, and that is probably because of the imperfect matching of the cable, and also there are a lot of other factors contribute to that. And I won't read into that too much, as for example, there are a lot of factors affecting it. The amplifier itself may not be as flat in terms of the frequency response as well. And of course, the matching may not be as perfect either. Anyway, we'll take that with a grain of salt, but uh, let's keep increasing the frequency here. So now I'm going to go to 100 MHz. And let's reacquire that signal. Of course, now we have increased to 1.2 volts. Again, given what I just mentioned before, this is uh, not something of a major concern. And now let's go straight to 180 MHz. So here we are sitting at 180 megahertz, and you can see that we are able to acquire the signal. Unfortunately, the fastest time base I think is five nanoseconds. So that is as fast as we can go. And the signal does become a little bit wobbly. Nevertheless, we are able to capture the sinusoidal at 180 megahertz with uh, no attenuation on magnitude at all. And the wobbling of the signal is definitely from the scope, as the HP8642B outputs a very clean signal. So it seems that we can reach this 180 MHz clean bandwidth with no problem. Let me keep increasing the output frequency to see the actual limit. So here is 200 MHz, and we'll keep increasing. And you can see we started seeing some artifacts already, and that is uh, at 218 MHz. So let's take a look at, uh, at what frequency we started seeing the artifacts. So let's see, back to 200. So it seems it's roughly around 200 MHz. So the actual measured frequency range is probably just a little bit higher than the specified 180 MHz. Let's keep increasing and see what we got here. Right now we're reaching 250 megahertz. So it definitely seems that the 180 megahertz claimed bandwidth is accurate. And in fact, the front end seems to be able to handle even higher frequency ranges because currently we're inputting a 250 megahertz signal and you can see the BPP is still sitting at 808 millivolts, still higher than the 3 dB bandwidth. So it seems in this case, the digital portion is actually the limiting factor. And because the maximum sampling rate is only at 500 mega samples per second, aliasing will occur at above 250 megahertz because of the Nyquist limit. And right now we're at exactly 250 megahertz. You can see we are actually not able to measure the frequency accurately anymore. So let me keep increasing the input frequency and see at what point we're not able to observe any waveforms at all. So let me increase. So now we're at 300 megahertz. And let's just keep increasing. 400. Yeah, you can see the alias in here. So roughly at 450 megahertz, you can still detect the presence of a signal. You can see here that's uh, 450 megahertz on the synthesizer. 
So although you can't accurately characterize the signal above 180 megahertz, you can still detect the presence of a signal up to a few hundred megahertz, which I suppose is still useful. Now let's take a look at the bandwidth with both channels enabled. If both channels are sharing the same ADC, then the sampling rate would be halved to 250 mega samples per second, and the maximum bandwidth would be limited to 125 megahertz at the best. Given the price point of this oscilloscope, I highly doubt it has independent ADCs for the front end. So let's take a look. Let me first readjust the synthesizer to 100 megahertz. And now let's enable channel two. Let's uh, enable. And we have channel two enabled. You can see that the signal measured on the channel one is not as stable as before. So let's increase the frequency here. So now we're at 100 megahertz and we're going to increase to 125. And you can already see we started having some artifact here. That is because we are approaching the Nyquist frequency of 125 megahertz, given that the sampling rate had halved. So let's uh, keep increasing the frequency. Now we're at 150 megahertz. You can see that we are not able to even calculate the frequency anymore because it's just not physically possible to capture a signal higher than 125 megahertz with a sampling rate of 250 mega samples per second. As you can see here, right now the frequency output is at 150 megahertz. This is with both channels enabled. So as expected, with both channels enabled, the bandwidth dropped to just 125 megahertz, and you will get aliasing with frequencies above that. And that's just the limitation of the sampling rate. So what I can say is that DPOX180H actually meets its advertised bandwidth, at least for single channel configuration. Anyway, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by the measurement results as I was not expecting it to achieve the 180 MHz bandwidth, to be very honest. For a scope just over $100, this is certainly a great feat for Fenersi to achieve. All right, with the bandwidth testing out of the way, let's take a look at a few other measurements. Now, I just want to point out a few annoyances. The first issue is that once you power it off, it actually loses all the settings that you just adjusted. And when you power it back on, it will restore to factory default. This is actually really annoying, as sometimes it takes a while to set up your channels. The second issue is the BNC input. And you can see it's very close to the edge. And uh, I didn't notice that with my 50 ohm adapter because that one was a little bit taller. But uh, with the standard BNC probe, it's actually very difficult to plug it in. And you can see here, my fingers are literally touching the side and have very little space to work with. But anyway, that is just some minor issues here. And uh, let's take a look at the signal here. So let me turn off the channel number two again. And let me change channel number one to AC coupling. And I will remember not to turn off the scope as I have to set up everything again. So let me move down the signal here to the middle and we auto acquire the signal. So right now, this is what is outputting from the O1DG2070. It's a 10 megahertz signal and we're gonna add some modulation on top and take a look here. And let me enable the modulation. So the first modulation I'm applying here is amplitude modulation at one kilohertz with a modulation depth of 100%. So let me reacquire the signal to see if we can automatically acquire it. Doesn't seem like it, which is quite normal. So let's uh, try to reduce the time base. And you can see that we are able to capture the signal and let's adjust the trigger level so it's a little bit more stable. So this is as stable as it gets. Now, the triggering manual, if you look at here, the trigger, we have auto, we have single and normal, but we don't seem to have any way of controlling the trigger hold off, which is gonna be critical for some of these kind of signals. So you can see we can adjust the edge channel 
and uh, high frequency rejection and that's about it and this one is probably used to make the trigger less noisy but you can see here we can enable this but the signal in the background is still wobbling back and forth so it doesn't seem there's any benefit of enabling the HF rejection here anyway so that's something to keep in mind when using this scope as we don't have that trigger hold off. But I have to say the display of the amplitude modulated signal looks quite nice. This is definitely a benefit of the digital phosphor technology here. And besides the digital phosphor display we're seeing right now, Fenersi also supports color temperature display. So let's take a look at that. You can see the color temperature. Let's hit OK. Color temperature. The menu takes some time to get used to, but uh, once you get used to it, it does make a lot of logical sense. The only thing I can see is that some of the items require multiple clicks to get to. But anyway, so that is some limitation with the number of fixed buttons you have on the scope here. So let's uh, get back. And you can see here is the color temperature display. And what you're looking at here is a frequency modulated signal. The carrier frequency is 1 MHz. The modulation frequency is 100 Hz with a frequency deviation of 100 kHz. And you can see just how fast the update rate is. Let's take a look at some other menu options here. So let's go back to channel 1. Let's see if we can enable the FFT here. So let's enable it. Let's see what we get here. OK. So by the look of it, it's very basic, and we can see that the FFT update rate is not as fast as the actual waveform update rate. And by the look of it, there's no way for us to change any of the settings on the FFT. So that's really basic. Let's just see if we can increase. Yeah, yeah there's nothing we can change on the FFT here. So anyway, so at least you get a sense of what that waveform looks like. So for instance, if I change it to a square waveform, you can see we do have a lot more harmonics here. And here is our original frequency modulated sinusoidal. All right, let's go back and turn off that FFT. And let's uh, check out the zoom here. Okay, so the zoom really is just uh, Actually, I suppose it could be nice because instead of changing the horizontals, you can look at the same signal with different time scales. And let's uh, reduce the time scale. And as you can see here, the smallest interval you can observe is 5 nanoseconds. So I'm wondering if I actually switch it all the way down to 5 nanoseconds, whether or not we still have this zoom capability. So let's take a look at that. Now I just changed the DG2070 output to 67 megahertz, that's the highest it can go. And also I reduced amplitude to 10 millivolts peak to peak. And that's one of the benefits of the furners. You can see that this portable scope has a minimum vertical sensitivity of five millivolts per division. And a lot of the handheld scopes only go down to 10 millivolts per division. Anyway, what we're trying to see here is whether or not the zoom works in the five nano division range here. So let's press zoom. Yep, as expected, it will not work because the lowest it can go is actually 5 nanoseconds. So if we change the horizontal to 10 nanoseconds, let's press the zoom again. Yep, as you can see, we can see this zoomed in waveform. So in my opinion, the zoom is not that useful as it doesn't give you any extra resolution on the horizontal, but it does give you the ability to see the waveform and the details side by side. And here I'm using the DG2070 to output a hard signal. That's an arbitrary waveform. You can see that we captured that signal with no problem. This is at 6 kilohertz. And now I just hooked up my avalanche pulse generator and let's take a look at the bandwidth from another angle. So let me try to auto acquire this. It probably is not able to do that. So let's, uh, yeah, you can see those tiny pulses here. But uh, let me reduce the time base here manually. And here is the pulse. And unfortunately, because we're at 5 nanoseconds per division, we are not able to measure the actual rise time that accurately. But nevertheless, let's enable the cursors, because we haven't looked at that yet. And let's see how easy it is to use that to do some measurements here. So let's uh, go in here, menu, 
let's do cursor horizontal cursor yep let's get out here let's try and move it okay so it seems like we probably need to do finer movements here so that's your beginning of the cursor how do I change to the other cursor okay I had to refer to the manual the problem of the cursor measurement is it's actually a little bit convoluted once it's enabled you have to use the auto key to switch between the left and right cursor and to move them accordingly. The problem of that is sometimes if you're out of the measurement mode for whatever reason, you press auto and the, the signal is being reacquired. And it took quite a bit of trial and error to eventually get to this point. Anyway, like what I said earlier, we don't have enough horizontal resolution to accurately measure the right sign, but right now you can see we're roughly at about 1.8 nanoseconds, and that does translate into a bandwidth of over 190 megahertz. So again, this validated the 180 megahertz bandwidth claim. And now let's take a look at the single shot capability. For that, I just hooked it up to a power supply, and I'm going to enable the power supply output, and let's see the captured waveform here. So you can see that at 10 milliseconds per division, we captured the waveform with no problem. And this power supply actually has a pretty long ramp up time. So let's reduce, rather let's increase the horizontal. And let's uh, do it again. So let's do 20 milliseconds. Let me change the waveform down a little bit. And let's do it again. As you can see, we capture the waveform with no problem. Unfortunately, there's no specification on the memory depth of this scope. And of course, as a dual channel scope, you can use it to display laser jewel figure. And right now I'm feeding in a five kilohertz signal into channel one and channel two. So let me adjust the frequency of channel two and let's see what we get here on the screen. And you can see the update rate is actually very fast. So that's quite nice for this Furnersi scope. We have no problem displaying the laser row figure at all. The scope does have some very limited signal generation capability. There's no dedicated signal output BNC, and the signal is outputted through the calibration connector on the top of the scope. Also, it appears that the output is always on. Now, let me enable the SIGGEN. You can see here, we have this tiny screen popped up. And what we can do is we can use the left and right to adjust the output signal type. And let's trigger it a little bit better. And let me just cycle through some of the waveforms here. You have square, you have sinusoidal. We have also pulse. And let's see what else we got. We have, we have quite a few different uh, waveforms for sure. But there's no way for us to adjust the output amplitude. And uh, it looks like the amplitude is set at roughly one volt peak to peak. But you can change the frequency though. So for that, you can press the mode and for example, right now we're at the duty cycle. You can see that is highlighted. We can change the duty cycle. And that's not a problem. Let's change it to 50. And we can also change the frequency here. So for example, we want to change it to 1 megahertz. And let's see the maximum frequency we can generate. By the look of it, it's uh, 10 megahertz. So let's acquire the signal and take a look. Of course, the quality of the waveform is not that great. At 10 megahertz, you can see this uh, square wave is totally distorted. But let's go to test another waveform here. Let's take a look at the sinusoidal. Yep, sinusoidal is perfectly fine at 10 megahertz. Anyway, as I said, the signal generator is really rudimentary. All right, I just opened it up and it was fairly easy to get the circuit board out. Everything seems to be very well thought out and the shooting cans are just simply clipped on over the input sections instead of being soldered on. So I didn't have to wrestle with them either.
The battery is a 3 amp hour one. I don't remember seeing any specifications on the runtime, but I can tell you the battery life should not be a concern as I have been using it for hours, and the battery indicator remains pretty much full. The front half of the case houses the LCD and the membrane keypad. The circuit board layout is very clean. All the components are populated on the top side, as you can see here, they're neatly laid out. Now, this is most likely a multi-layer board, but I'm not entirely sure at this moment. We'll take a look later. Anyway, let's take a closer look. On the left side, under the shooting cans, are the front ends of the two input channels. You can see we have two identical sections, one for each channel. The op amps used here are these RS622s. These are general purpose reel-to-reel -reel op amps, and they only have a bandwidth of 7 MHz. So these are definitely not the ones responsible for the front end amplification. So my guess is that the front end is done using some discrete transistors. And by the way, I have verified that on the back, even though we have these uh, shielding cans, there's nothing underneath. These are simply just to shield the BNC connectors. I had removed one of them earlier to verify. And if you trace the BNC input, you will see that it is actually connected to this resistor here. So let me just show you. Let me trace it out. You can see that we have a resistor here. And that's where the BNC inputs into. So it's that tiny resistor there. So this is another reason I believe this is a multi-layer board. As you can see here, we don't have any other traces coming in there. There's a via popping up from the bottom. And on the bottom side, you can see we don't have any obvious traces on this end. So clearly, this trace is done in some inner layers. And it appears that the signal after it going through that resistor, it goes through this input relay for range switching. And then there are a few transistors on this side of this relay. So presumably these transistors are responsible for the signal amplification. Now, because there is no adjustable components, it is very likely that the gain characteristics of the front end is calibrated and the calibration data is stored in memory. Or it could be the front end is not calibrated at all, which probably is the case, as otherwise it would be too expensive for the manufacturer to individually characterize each channel and each unit. This kind of explained why we saw the signal amplitude change even with a matched 50 ohm input earlier. Anyway, that is just my guess. And here we have this uh, CD4051 A21 MUX and the output signal from each channel then goes through these two ADCs in the middle here. Unfortunately, as you can see, the markings on these ADCs are deliberately removed. So we have no way of knowing what ADCs exactly they were using. But as we saw earlier, with both channels enabled, the sampling rate dropped to 250 mag samples per second. That tells me that these ADCs are each running at 250 mag samples per second. And when only a single channel is in use, they work together and are interleaved and thus produce the effective 500 mag samples per second sampling rate. This technique works, but the clock stability and how closely these two ADCs are matched are crucial as each of these ADCs are running independently. This could have explained why the capture signal at higher frequencies was not entirely stable as we saw earlier. But this is definitely one way to increase the effective sampling rate. And when done right, it could lower the cost as higher sampling rate ADCs are significantly more expensive. Anyway, after these two ADCs, you can see that they are controlled by this FPGA, which is a EF2L45LG144B. The only information I can find is this high-level information from Nlogic's website. It has over 4,000 lookup tables, which is a decent size for this application. And you can see all these traces are length matched between these two ADCs and the FPGA. And this is critical for high-frequency applications especially when they are interleaving these two ADCs to form that 500 mag samples per second sampling rate. Now let's uh, move it down a little bit. You can see above the ADC here is our application processor. This is an all-winner F1C100S SOC, which contains an ARM CPU along with 32 meg of onboard DDR memory. And up here we have a 128 megabit windbound flash memory. Here we also have a IP2312 battery charging controller. 
And let me move it down. By the look of it, we also have quite a few of these DC to DC converters that generates different voltage rails needed by the FPGA, by the look of it. And let me move it down further. And by the look of it, here in this section, we have a MS5351. That's a tiny chip there. That's a clock generator. And I'm not sure what this A-pin chip is, as it doesn't have any markings on top. It could be a differential amplifier. As you can see, we do have a couple of these very thin traces that goes in the general area of that chip. And that's all the circuitry in this oscilloscope. And if we flip over the board, you can see there is really not a whole lot going on on the reverse side. Basically, these are just contacts for the keypad. And that's about it. Well, that's all I plan to cover in this video. There are still a lot of features that I have not touched upon, and please let me know if there's anything else you guys wanted to see with this DPXO180H. All in all, I'm pretty impressed with the capability of this oscilloscope, especially taking its price point into consideration. It met its specified 180MHz single-channel bandwidth claim, and that by itself is quite impressive. It even comes with two 200MHz probes, and I don't know how they managed to keep the price this low. The signal acquisition quality is not top-notch by any stretch of imagination, but it's certainly good enough for what you pay for. I can definitely see the competition in the entry-level oscilloscope market getting even more fierce. Now, I'm not a big fan of the manual system, and certain settings are just very obscure and hard to work with. That said, being a handheld device with limited number of input options, the manufacturer did a decent job optimizing the user interface to accommodate your most common use case scenarios. The one gripe I have is that it does not remember any of the settings once you power cycle the oscilloscope, unless you remember to save the settings manually. This unfortunately adds a lot of overhead every time you power on the scope. This is something I hope Fernersi can address in a firmware update, as it is purely a software issue. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave a comment if you have any questions, and I'll try to address. If you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.